magandang umaga po sa ating lahat sa panambahan ngayon. Uh, linggo, tayo po ay mag-uumpisa ng isang mission series. Ang tawag po dito ay Integral Mission. Ito po ay ta tatlong bahagi. Mag-uumpisa po tayo sa tinatawag na Cultural Monday. Uh, yung yung pong unang-unang sa tingin po ay comprehensive na idea ng integral mission. When we're thinking of mission, usually uh, we're talking full-time Christian work or going overseas to do cross-cultural mission where the emphasis is on the going rather than on discipling and or going on short mission trips. You will notice that um, in all of these, we will try and see that there is no such thing as full-time Christian work. Being Christian is always full-time, whatever is you do. And also, going overseas in doing cross-cultural mission is not just all there is to mission. And also, I am very skeptical as to whether there is such a thing as short-term mission. To me, the most important question about mission is this. What really is the mission of God? What is God doing in the world? And how can we be part of this mission? Let me outline quite briefly the big story of God's mission and its implications on our understanding of missions and our mission enterprise. First, a historical overview. During the past 50 years, there has been a recovery of the social dimension of the gospel. There is the renewed focus on social responsibility as integral to the mission of the church. Mostly, the debate centered on the relationship between evangelism and social action. And this relationship was first defined formally among evangelicals in the Lausanne Covenant of 1974. And I quote, We affirm that evangelism and social political involvement are both parts of our Christian duty. Evangelism and social responsibility while distinct from one another, are integrally related in our proclamation of and obedience to the gospel. Among the World Council of Churches, the emphasis has been on what I call the two P's, proclamation and presence. We proclaim that there is a new social order, a new world where justice and righteousness reigns. And we bear witness to its presence whenever we stand against all that bids us to be subject to anything other than God and His kingdom. In 1997, the Evangelicals, Pentecostals and Charismatics, and the social activists of the World Council of Churches came together and formulated a threefold mission for the church. We called it the three W's. Word, which is the emphasis of evangelicals. Works, the emphasis of social activists. And wonders, the emphasis of those in charismatic circles. Now in 2001, under the shadow of 9-11, there was a gathering of evangelical social uh, development people as well as activists and came up with uh, what we call the MICA Network Declaration. And the word that surfaced was integral mission. I actually argued in our drafting committee, there were two British and Senor Nepatia and myself, 
who drafted this uh, declaration, and I argued that for a non-English speaking world, holistic mission is easier to understand. But uh, I was told by my colleagues who are all men, but integral mission is probably a better term. And Senor Padilla, uh, our most senior member of the drafting committee, said that in Spanish, in Mission Integral is actually much more evocative of what we mean by holistic. So, well, being the only woman in that committee, so of course I was outvoted. But since then, we have adopted the language of integral. And according to this document, integral mission or holistic transformation is the proclamation and demonstration of this. Now, let me begin by putting all of this in a broader frame. The mission day, the making of a new heaven and a new earth. While all these movements have advanced clarity in our understanding of missions, centering it on justice and evangelism or social responsibility. I think this is too narrow a vision of what God is doing in the world and the part of the church in it. We actually need a much bigger frame and that is the mission day, which, according to scripture, is no less than the redeeming of the whole world, the recreation of a fallen world into a new heaven and a new earth. As early as Genesis 3, we are given the promise that always there will be this conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And in this conflict, humankind shall crush the serpent's head. Our heel shall be bruised. In other words, we will also suffer and be wounded. But eventually, we shall win this battle. The battle between good and evil shall be won by the woman's offspring. And we know from theologians that this is prominently Jesus the Christ. And with him, all those who belong to him shall win this battle. Scholars call this promise the proto evangelium, the first gospel, giving us hope through the promised Savior. Now, the pattern of human sin and God's judgment in the first 12 chapters of Genesis. You see, Adam and Eve banished from paradise for making themselves the final authority in what is good and evil. Cain murders Abel and he is uprooted from the land and condemned to the inorganic life of a city. We see spirit beings intermarrying with humans to produce demigods. Find that in chapter 6, pushing the limits of the created order so that God limits now human life to 120 years. And lastly, towards the end in Genesis 11, we have a monocultural baby center of civilization at that time and the people embarked on an ambitious project building a tower that reaches the heavens so as to make a name for themselves all these stories set the stage for the calling out of abraham god's final remedy for human sin is the election of a race through Abraham. All the families of the earth shall finally be blessed 
through you. Bondra, an Old Testament scholar, makes this point. From the multitude of nations, God chooses a man, loses him from tribal ties, and makes him the beginner of a new nation and the recipient of great promises of salvation. What is promised to Abraham reaches far beyond Israel. Indeed, it has universal meaning for all generations on earth. Unquote. Notice that the promise to Abraham of being a blessing to all families of the earth follows immediately the story of the Tower of Babel, with its project of creating a secure, solid society with no need for God. Now, fast forward to Pentecost. Here we see tongues of fire descending upon the apostles, and they begin to speak in the native languages of all the diaspora Jews, as well as the God-fearing Gentiles who were gathered in Jerusalem. In this story, we see the curse of Babel, the confusion of languages being overturned. And here is the commentary of N.G. Wright on this. God, he says, is dramatically signaling that his promise to Abraham is being fulfilled. And the whole human race is going to be addressed with the good news of what has happened in and through Jesus. And at the end of time, in John's final vision of salvation history, we hear loud voices from heaven proclaiming the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And finally, in Revelation 21 and 22, we get glimpses of this new heaven and new earth. We hear him who is seated on the throne saying, Behold, I am making all things new. If the mystery day is the making of the new heaven and the new earth, what then is the mission of the church? What does it mean for the church to be part of God's mission? Day? For the sake of simplicity, let me capture the whole lesson of this mission in what I call the three C's. Integral mission is the cultural mandate. You find that in Genesis 1 26 to 29. We are aiming here at a new heaven and a new earth. Also, the mission of the church involves the great commandment Matthew 22 34 to 40. We shall love our neighbor as ourselves and love God. Most of them. Then, here we have the Gospel of Reconciliation. Then we have the Great Commission, which is familiar to all of us. Discipling all nations. I shall talk about the Great Commandment of the Great Commission later in this series. For the moment, we shall zero in and focus on the cultural mandate. We are talking, first of all, of the making of a new heaven and a new earth. And then we will focus on forgiveness and reconciliation in the next series. And then the discipling of nations and what the Great Commission means. Now, the cultural mandate. We shall begin with this as outlined in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. As we have seen, the redemptive work of God in the world is not just saving souls. It is the remaking of the whole heaven and earth. 
And Jesus saving me is comprehensive. Through the cross, we are reconciled to God and to each other, but also restored to mastery and care over creation. The work of Jesus on the cross involves not just a personal, but a social and a cosmic dimension. Paul tells us that all creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Find that in Romans 8, verse 19. In other words, we are to show up to make visible the saving power and presence of God in the face of scarcity, of catastrophe, and all kinds of social evil. We need to reveal the fact that we are children of God who stand for the King. And once again, here we are being invited to be co creators with God in the making of a new heaven and a new earth. We are to be fruitful and multiply make our families, our businesses, our societies grow and flourish. And we are invited not just to grow, but also to govern, to subdue the bad effects of sin in human social. And it may be asked, what in practical terms is our vision of a new heaven and a new earth? Marxists have their own vision. Capitalists have their own vision. Many others have revolutionary projects. What is our vision of this new heaven and the new earth? Now, very early in the Old Testament, particularly in Isaiah, we are given a picture of what this can be. In Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, it says that there shall be healing especially of bad memories. Isaiah 65 gives us a picture of what our vision of a new heaven and a new earth can be like. In Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, we have this healing, especially of bad memories. Behold, he says, I create a new heaven and a new earth, the former things shall not be remembered. So much of the conflict in the world today between Arabs and Israelis, between the, in the Northern Ireland as well as in many other places, people, different tribes in Africa, the Hutus and the Tutsis, the Sinhalese in Sri Lanka, and the Tamils and so on. All of these ethnic uh, Conflicts are rooted in memory, in historical memory of violence, of humiliation, of colonialism. And it is a very good promise to find that all of these bitter things shall no longer be remembered. And even in our own personal experience, we now talk about the healing of memories. So, this is the first thing that is being told about us. That there shall be this healing of memories. I imagine that during this pandemic, people have a lot of very sad memories of their relatives or their family members dying. And they are not beside them. They die alone in hospitals. And not only that, they do not have all these ceremonies and rituals for the dead. All that we see of them afterwards as family members, as relatives, or as friends, is this box of ashes given to us by a hospital personnel. In other words, there is so much that needs to be here in our memories of this pandemic. And this is a promise to us that there will be a healing of our memories. The first
former things shall not be repeated. Also, there will be joy. No more weeping, crying, distress. And it says, I create Jerusalem as a people of joy. The people of God themselves become sources of gladness. Yung church, hindi na mukhang mga mahahaba ang mukha. Kundi, a people of joy. In other words, when they come to us, when they happen to be in our company, in our fellowship, they sense a gladness, they sense a joy. We become truly a people of joy. And then, we are also told that we will have long life. There shall be no more infant mortality. No more shall there be an infant, an infant who lives but a few days. Or an old man who does not fill out his days. Longevity. Disease is no longer to ravage us as before. And then there is work and the enjoyment of it. They shall build houses habit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inherit. They shall not plant and another eat. This reminds me of our OFWs. We build construction projects in Saudi Arabia and other places. But our poor construction workers have not been. We plant, have all these crash crops that we produce in our very fertile land, then we never see this fruit. I remember going to Japan once and seeing all these nice bananas, all the very large bones. And I said, where do you get this? I never get to see them. And they said, well, they come from the fields. At the end of my stay, I start asking myself, how come they eat our produce and we ourselves get only the leftovers? Yung mga hindi na na-export at hindi po masa sa quality control. That is what we get, you know, as consumers in our own country. All of our best produce goes out into the world in the name of globalization. So, one of the promises is that we will reverse this. We will have food security for our own people. We shall plant and we shall eat our own food. And we will build houses and inhabit them. Also, you have this picture of the people of God becoming like the tree becoming secure and enjoying the work of their hands. It says, we are not going to labor in pain or bear children for calamity. No more generational poverty. Bearing children who are destined for this endless cycle of poverty. And most of all, there will be intimacy with before they call, I will answer, he said. While they are yet speaking, I shall hear. In other words, there will be this intimate fellowship with God himself. Before they call, I will answer. In other words, our prayers will no longer feel like we are talking to the world or to a God who is absent or silent in the universe. In fact, before we utter a prayer, God will answer. And lastly, we are told that the wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. Nature shall be in harmony. Those who are big, like the wolf and the lion, and who are predatory, will now lie down 
and grace with the Lamb, with those who are weak. And the serpent, which used to be a figure of temptation, and something to be afraid of, is no longer hurtful. It eats dust and does not bite. In fact, the whole animal world, and I suppose the whole of the world, the human society, shall not hurt or destroy anyone in God's world. So this is the vision that is given to us. So we need to ask ourselves, is our present work, the things we do with our hands now, is this transforming the earth or merely saving souls from a sinking ship? Is our mission simply the saving of souls from a sinking ship? There is a great deal of talk these days about Armageddon, that we are seeing signs of the end of the age. And it is easy to feel this is a sinking ship, so we must just evangelize and forget about planting a tree, forget about investing in our material environment, investing in all the technologies and medicine and so forth. No. Because God's work of transformation remains comprehensive. The remaking of the whole earth and heaven as well. Now what is the implication of this in our everyday life? First of all, all of life, when lived in the presence of God, is sacred. Biblically, there is no divide between the secular and the sacred. Mission, or ministry as a whole, is actually the work of all believers, not just by so-called full-time Christian workers. Those of us who are full-time in so-called ministry, are actually equipers. You find that in Ephesians 4. But the work of ministry is really the entire people of God. The pastor, the evangelist, the teachers, all of these are meant to what? Equip the saints for the work of ministry. And whatever it is we do, we are told, we do all to the glory of God. I think it's important that we do away with this divide between the secular and the sacred. Jesus himself puts the supernatural, the casting out of demons, for instance, in Mark chapter 9, on the same day as the giving of a cup of water. It's very natural, very ordinary, and mosaic act. Of compassion in the mind of Jesus is on the same level as the casting out of demons. He says in fact that this small act, this small gesture, shall by no means lose its power. We have a similar story in the story of this woman who pours out expensive perfume on Jesus just before he gets killed on the cross. This gesture of adoration in pouring a jar of expensive perfume on Jesus, he says, will always be here. If you look at it closely, the gesture had no social significance. It did not save anybody. But according to Jesus, she has done a beautiful thing to me. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be to me in memory of God. We should remember that we have a God who has an eye for details, an eye for things of beauty, whether these are acts of service and passion, 
or apparently useless acts like pouring this expensive perfume. Judah said, for instance, you know, this is a year's wages. Would they be given to the poor? Well, Jesus says, do not trouble. Why do you bother? She has done a beautiful thing. This is important to those of us who are artists or writers. Sometimes I think of how difficult it is and how long it takes to develop a craft to be a really good writer or a really good artist. And sometimes you sort of ask, what is the point? You know, we are not evangelizing, quote unquote. But if this is done in Jesus, if this is done as an act of adoration, of who Jesus is, Jesus says to us, because you have done the beautiful thing to me, this day will always be in your mind. In other words, it will endure in some. Sometimes when I look at these magnificent cathedrals in Europe, you know, you look at the cathedral in Rome, in Germany, you look at the Westminster Cathedral in, in England and other countries like that, you sort of ask, how come all the artists and craftsmen, you know, have done this out of love, out of worship, you know, of the God that they serve? through their hands and their skills. We, how come this will just be useless if we think that what will endure is simply all these souls that we have behind our backs when we go to heaven? Now we are told in Revelation that all the splendor, all the riches, all the nations, all the cultures, the best of what we know as cultures, will be brought into the new Jerusalem. You will find that in Revelation 21. In other words, all the splendor of human cultures, minus the sin, will be brought into the new Jerusalem. So it is not going to be in vain if those of you spend a great deal of time inventing new medicine for COVID, inventing new technologies so that our life becomes more convenient and bearable, inventing all kinds of things so that human society is flourishing. This is the culture. And to the extent that this reflects the nature of our creator, to the extent that this really honors and glorifies him. This will ensure. So we need to revise our idea of what is eternally significant. The mission day tells us also that we need to recover our sense of vocation. We need to have a mission of sense to the work each of us is called to be an outpost of the kingdom in whatever occupation we find ourselves in. When we honor God and speak His word in the language of our professions, whether we are carpenters or artists, we are actually the church is scattered. What theologians call the visible church. The visible church is not just the local church. It is the church is scattered, making visible in public space what we learn and believe. And these things, of course, that we learn and believe, we get from the church gathered, the local church, our local community of believers. So, science and technology, politics, the arts, media, business, we need to be outposts of the will of God 
in all of these aspects of society and see it as mission, as vocation. One of the 